So dads, uh, uh, I got some good news. Good news. They have come up with, you know, uh, maybe you don't know, do you know what Alexa is from Amazon? It's like that, that a digital assistant, like if you go, uh, if you go walk in my house and say Alexa, things start flashing and, and stuff like that. You know, it, it will, it'll turn on my lights, it'll turn, it'll set my thermostat, it will give me the camera, security camera, the doorbell camera, you know, and, and I say, Alexa, show me my stuff, and it's everything that my wife's ordered on Amazon, so that takes a little while, and uh, all, all those types of things, right? It's, a, it's like that digital assistant. Well, they've come out with this Alexa-type device, assistant, dads, that's going to give you a break from the pressures of being a dad, no matter how old you are or your children are. And I just want to show it to you, because you're going to want to get this. If you're still struggling with life in the real world, you're going to love our latest home speaker device. Hey, Dad, what kind of pliers should I use on this? Uh, you should be using a wrench. Oh, do I have a wrench? You have three. Ah, thanks, Dad. Introducing the Dad Personal Assistant, our newest smart speaker with all the character and compassion of a father. Up and at him, it's a beautiful day. Dad, it's Saturday. Yeah, it's a great day to get outside. It's 6 a.m. Well, then you better get moving before it gets any later. Designed with advanced features, the Dad PA connects to all your other smart home devices. Dad, please set the thermostat to 70 degrees. No problem, setting the thermostat to 68 degrees. Um, no, let's keep it at 70 degrees. Sure thing. Thanks, Dad. We're gonna save so much money. He syncs with your calendar to help you stay on track. Looks like you're overdue for an oil change. Oh, hey, you're right. Can you schedule one for Friday? I've already got it scheduled. Just don't miss it, okay? <laughs> okay, I won't. <laughs> Seriously, don't miss it. The Dad PA is always watching out for you. Lights on. Uh, hey, it's getting late. I think it's about time for Brad to head home. <sighs> Dad! The Dad Personal Assistant includes a wealth of knowledge and opinions on a wide variety of subjects. Dad, can you help me with my taxes? Dad, do you know a good mechanic? Hey, Dad, can you tell me a joke? Sure. The joke is one billion dollars. Uh, I don't get it. That's right. And you never will. Ah, uh, nice one. <laughs> Oh, I'm hilarious. Based on God's original design, the dad personal assistant is wise, caring, faithful, and devoted. Don't worry. You've got this. You are the strongest person I know. You have made me so proud. You are God's child, and you don't need anyone else to complete you, especially not Brad. <sighs> Really, Dad? I'm just saying, there's other fish in the sea. Okay, wow. The Dad Personal Assistant. Always thoughtful, always dependable, and always there for you. <laughs> Hope you don't go looking for that, because I don't think there's... So today is our day, Father's Day, and you know, somehow it's never as held in as high regard as Mother's Day, it seems, right? They just, mothers have that certain something and, you know, and, and, and after all, you know, uh, whenever you see someone holding like a, a sign, they got an award, it's always, hey mom, you know, you don't often hear, hey dad. Now listen, I am not complaining. There's no sour grapes here. Because the truth is, I know my wife put in way more time and energy in raising our boys than I did, especially in their younger years. And I am so grateful for that. How many of you have ever heard of Irma Bombeck? A lot of you. So if you don't, it's, she was, uh, she's since uh, passed away, but she was a writer and often just, just like these short story things that often were in the newspaper, some hilarious and some. And so she actually wrote one that was about the, the day God created women, but she's also done one about the day God created men. And I want to share that one with you. It says, when the good Lord was creating fathers, he started with a tall frame. And an angel nearby said, what kind of father is that? If you want to make children so close to the ground, why would you put fathers up so high? You won't be able to shoot marbles without kneeling or tuck a child in bed without bending or even kiss a child without a lot of stooping. God smiled and said, yes, but if I make him child size, who would children have to look up to? And when God made a father's hands, he made them large and sinewy. And the angel shook her head sadly and said, Do you know what you're doing? 
Large hands are clumsy. They can't manage diaper pins, small buttons, rubber bands on ponytails, or, or even remove splinters caused by baseball bats. God smiled and said, I know, but they are large enough to hold everything a small boy empties out of his pockets at the end of the day, and yet small enough to cup a small child's face. And then God molded long, slim legs and broad shoulders, and the angel nearby nearly had a heart attack. Man, this is the end of the week, all right. Do you realize you just made a father without a lap? How's he going to pull a child close to him without the kid falling between his legs? God smiled and said, a mother needs a lap. A father needs strong shoulders to pull a sled or to balance a boy on a bicycle or hold a sleepy hand on the way home from the circus. God was in the process of creating two of the largest feet anybody had ever seen when the angel could not contain himself any longer. That is not fair. Do you honestly think those large boats are going to dig out of bed early in the morning when a baby cries or walk through the birthday party without crushing at least three of the guests? God smiled and said, they'll work, you'll see. They'll support a small child who wants to ride a horse to Banbury Cross or scare off mice at the summer cabin or display shoes that will be a challenge to fill. God worked throughout the night, giving the father a few words, but a firm, authoritative voice, eyes that saw everything but remained calm and tolerant. Finally, almost as an afterthought, he added tears. Then he turned to the angel and said, Now are you satisfied that he can love as much as a mother? <laughs> well, some of us can identify with Irma Bombeck's character's Realization. Either, either a fond memories of growing up with our own father, or maybe because we see ourselves as the father whose feet are too big to crawl out of bed when the baby cries. But whatever the reason, today is Father's Day. And just like we do on Mother's Day, we, we got to recognize, don't we, that, that, that days set aside to, to honor particular people or relationships can also be painful days. So for some of us, you know what, our relationship with our dad, uh, and maybe it still is, is, is strained and, and sometimes holds some painful memories. For others, it's a, a mixture of joy and sadness because you have fond memories, but now that's all you have because your dad's no longer with us. I also think of maybe a father who's lost a child and that makes Father's Day extremely painful, or, or I think of a friend of mine who wanted to be a dad, but he and his wife were not able to have children, and so maybe a day like this also just reminds them of a void. So just recognizing that days like this can bring a multitude of emotions, right? Um, but I want to do this morning, because you know what? Father's Day sermons are, can either be praising fathers as being invaluable. But in truth, I, I, you, know, you know, I think in Mother's Day, we, uh, at least for me, but I think generally speaking in sermons, it's, you know, the, the blessing of motherhood or the encouragement of motherhood. And a lot of times with dads, it's, it, it's you know, how to pick up the slack. You know, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, let's, let's, we got to, um, rather than doing any of that, uh, what I, what I want to do is, Turn our attention for a moment to our Heavenly Father and focus on the characteristics that he has as the perfect parent. And let's listen to see what God has to say to any of us or, or all of us this morning. Now, for some of us, um, our relationship and our understanding of <clears throat> our Heavenly Father is about love Right? It's about comfort, peace, security. And for some, maybe that's not the case, whether, whether you're struggling to understand who God is or how do you, how do you relate to God as a, as a heavenly father. Uh, I remember uh, just hearing uh, there were some missionaries that went to New York City to kind of just talk about God, and, and a lot of it had to do with youth. And uh, they were struggling because there, a, lot of, a lot of the children there did not have good images of a father. 
or maybe they were an absentee father or, or something. So to talk about God as a heavenly father was actually a negative, right? And so they turned it around and said, what, is, what would you picture as the perfect father and began to have these conversations and then were able to say, that's who God is, right? Um, I don't know where you're at in, in, in terms of all of God as your heavenly father, right? But, but I want to look at this scripture today. It's a parable, parable that Jesus taught. Uh, and it's one of the more pure, grace-filled descriptions of our heavenly father in the entire scriptures, right? We, and and some, someone has referred to this parable as the greatest short story ever, greatest short story of the world. It focuses actually on several family dynamics. And all of them we can identify with in some way. It deals with rebellion. It deals with sibling rivalry. It, 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 it deals with alienation from family, the consequences of foolish living, the joy of reunion, and the power of forgiveness. Each one of those, right, they provide us with plenty of thought and discussion to see where God is in, in, in our lives and in our homes. And, but instead of considering this parable, which we often call the prodigal son, right? let's think of it as the parable of the loving father this morning. Because on Father's Day, may this serve as the model of our heavenly father and a model for us dads as fathers, so let me, let me set up the story. It begins in, it's in Luke chapter 15. This is the first two verses. So right? it just says these tax, tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Right? But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. Don't you like that word, muttered? Rah, 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 you know? This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So that's, that's the context. you got tax collectors, sinners wanting to hear Jesus, Pharisees and teachers of the law muttering about him hanging around with such people. And so Jesus tells in Luke 15 three parables, all about something that's lost. The lost sheep, and then he talks about the lost coin, and he ends in, the, it's in that chapter, he ends with the story of the lost son. And, and I think this and, and the, all, all the three parables there in Luke 15, I, I, I think, I mean, they're all about something that was lost, right? And I think he had two reasons for telling it. And the first was for the tax collectors and sinners, just to give them hope and to show them who a loving God is. And, but he also told it for the sake of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to admonish them about how they thought about people, lost people. So the story of, of, of the prodigal son, or the loving father, begins by saying a father had two sons. And the youngest son asks his father for his share of the inheritance. Now, in those days, in that time, in the first century, you had no say over what you got. This was the standard. Now, obviously, if you only had one son, they got everything. Okay? If you had two or more, the oldest son got two-thirds of the inheritance of the property. The second oldest got the other third. And if there are any younger siblings, they were dependent upon their brothers now. Right? Two-thirds go to the oldest. One-third goes to the second oldest. And here's a man with two sons. So the oldest son was to get the two-thirds share. The younger son, the one-third share. But it's the younger son that goes up to his dad and says, Dad... I want, I want now, I want my share now, my one third. Right? Now, listen, it wasn't uncommon for a father to share that inheritance before he died. It would be like, I want to step back from the family business. I want to step, I'm going to retire in essence. And so I'm going to give my oldest son two thirds and my next oldest the one third, and they're going to run things and they'll take care of me in essence but I've made that decision. I'm going to hand it off now so that, and take a step back and let them be in charge. Okay. That's not what happened here. 
It was not common for a son to go ask the father, can I have it now? Right? Because that request is a slap in the father's face. His son is basically saying, thanks, dad, but I'd rather have your estate right now more than I want you. Now, the father here apparently knew that there are some lessons that can only be learned firsthand. So, and according to the parable, because remember, it, it's, not a, it's not like a historical document here. A parable is a teaching moment, a teaching story. So, the father says, okay. Gives the younger son a third of the estate. And it tells us that this son then goes to a foreign country. Now, remember who the audience is here. This is a Jewish story, right? Tax collectors and sinners, they're Jewish. The Pharisees, teachers of the law, obviously Jew Jewish. So when Jesus says he went to a foreign country, he's really saying they went to a Gentile country, a non-Jewish country. And then it says he basically squandered it all, wild living, all these kinds of things. He just partied, hardy the whole time, everything, right? And, and then he loses everything. He foolishly squanders the inheritance. And then, to top it off, a famine comes into that foreign country, that foreign land, and he's got nothing. So he finds himself with a job feeding and living with pigs. Now remember the context. Who's the audience? Jewish. Pigs are unclean. Jesus isn't just randomly picking something out of the air as a, by the way, you got this little job over here. This Jewish person is now feeding and living with unclean pigs. It's an important point of that story. And then Jesus uses this phrase. I love this phrase. He sits there and he says, and the younger son came to himself. I love that phrase. He came to himself. In other words, he got clarity of himself and his circumstances. Right? Because you see, Jesus believed that so long as a person is away from God, they're not truly himself, themselves. He was only, a person is only truly themselves when they're on their way home to God. Coming home on Father's Day. Right? Um, <clears throat> and the son recognizes in this job Man, I, the pigs have better, more food than I have. I, I wish I could eat what they, and nobody's given me anything. He's, he's starving, it's a famine, he's lost everything, and here I am working on a pig farm. Anybody here ever work on a pig farm? I have. Ew, it is the worst smelling thing you can imagine. Uh, I did that for a while when I was in seminary. It, it uh, was helping somebody out in the church. It was disgusting. Um, disgusting work. And he comes to himself and realizes some things, right? Coming home. Father, coming home means different things for us. Um, just mentioned seminary. So Kathy and I, when we got married, uh, by the way, celebrated 43 years last week, huh? Uh, when we got married, we moved 1,500 miles to the Midwest, to Minnesota, where I was attending seminary. We lived there for three years. And, and after that, our, my first church experience was in upstate New York. We're actually going to be heading back there next month just to visit with some friends. Uh, but we were there for 10 years. And, and so that's kind of far away, especially with Rhode Island mentality. You know, I kid you not. I mean, it was different when we moved here, but... We still didn't get invited to family things because, you know, you live way up in Rhode Island. And we grew up in New Bedford. That's it's like half an hour away. You know, it's like, and, and, and so we still were included. Oh, you live way up there. It's okay. Because in Minnesota and in 
rural New York, we could drive an hour easily to get to places, right? It was okay. Uh, but anyway, we would come home and visit family in those times. And, and, and that was an interesting thing because it, we were like going home. And we would look forward to that, uh, to visit with family and visit with friends and see familiar places and to go out and eat our favorite pizza, which closed during COVID, and I'm still bitter about that. So it, it, it's, it's all of that, right? And, and the other interesting dynamic is coming home. See, Kathy was like the only one in her family that ever moved away at that time, right? So all the families there. She had two sisters, at the, and it was like, oh, George and Kathy are coming home, your parents, you know? And I think, I think they actually said, oh, the prodigal daughter's coming home, you know? No, she, wild living, skin, no, that wasn't her. Um, it was just that it was, there was some of that feeling of the older brother, you know, coming home, and parents are all excited because they're going to see, and we're here all the time, and we're taken for granted, you know, that, that you understand some family dynamics there. But it was always good coming home. There was always that, that feeling of the familiar, something that's there, right? The loving father in today's parable, who represents God, is waiting for his son. We don't know how long he's been gone. It's doubtful that there's been any correspondence between them since he left. Um, And and, and the son is is in this position. Well, he's more humble. See, he's come to himself. And, he, and when he did that, he realized some things. He realized, you know what? My father's hired hands, my father's servants, actually have it better than I do. They don't go to bed hungry. So he comes up with this plan, which required, by the way, a great deal of humility on his part to come home. And he he comes up with this plan that just simply says, and he writes a speech. He literally writes a speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I am, I'm no longer even worthy to be called your son. Let me be one of your hired hands and I'll just work for you. Okay. So he, he, he he, so he leaves. He's hoping to be welcomed, but not as a son. He blew it. He's, he will be very happy, he decides, to just be one of his father's servants, because that's better than what he's, he's in now, right? Um, and I imagine that his stomach is in knots and, and as he rounds this familiar bend, knowing that his home lies just over the hill. And he's talking to himself. He's just going over the speech. You know? But there's no need. There's no need because his father is on the lookout, anxiously awaiting the return of his son. He never stopped looking. You know, when when, when we drift from God, maybe that's where some of you are are today. You you were once, you're a follower, but you're, you're drifting. You're drifting away. Or maybe somebody hearing this, maybe you're hearing it online, and you didn't drift. You made a decision to walk away. So I want you to know, so if you get nothing else, I want you to know this. Your heavenly Father is waiting and looking for your return. Coming home. To a heavenly father means turning a corner and finding him waiting, ready to run out to you and greet you and embrace you. And that's what we find in this story. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read just a few verses of that from 15. Uh, from Luke 15, I'm going to begin with verse 20, all right? So this is, the context is, he comes to himself, he decides he's going to go home, right? So it says, So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him 
and he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. What a great response, right? So the son now begins his speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father just cuts him off. Doesn't even get to finish the story here of what he wrote. Father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And so they began to celebrate. Isn't that a great response here? Coming home to a heavenly father means forgiveness awaits. I gotta tell you, there are just too many homes that are bound by division and, and, and tension because of the unwillingness to forgive. But thankfully, coming home to a heavenly father always means forgiveness. When the son returns home, here's the thing, and it's you would think Debbie and I maybe talked about her prayer in my sermon ahead of time, but we did not. In fact, she just texted me this morning and said, can I pray for, you know, for, for fathers, right? He didn't just find forgiveness, he found restoration. Restoration. His hope was to be treated as a servant, but he was restored to the family. Think about that. He was given a robe which signifies honor. He would not be treated as a servant. He would be restored as a son. He was given a ring which signified authority. Because remember, we talked about this in the Holy Spirit is the seal on our lives. It's like that signet ring. Signet rings were used to seal letters and important papers. And the giving of one signet ring to another is granting someone, in essence, like the power of attorney. Okay? He was given a ring for his finger. He was also given shoes. Servants aren't given shoes. Family gets shoes. Each of them is given to the son, and they, every one of them served as a symbol that he was being restored to the full status of a member of the family. Coming home on Father's Day means forgiveness, but not as a favor. It's forgiveness that involves complete restoration. That's God's grace. President Lincoln was asked how he was going to treat the rebellious Southerners when they had finally been defeated and had returned to the Union of the United States. The questioner expected that Lincoln would talk about vengeance. He said, I will treat them as if they had never been away. That's God. Treat us as if we've never been away. The same way when we, we come home, he anxiously awaits us and offers forgiveness and promises complete restoration as if we'd never been away. And by the way, when that happened in this story, there's, there's no forcing, there's no manipulation going on. The younger son came to himself. He made this decision to come home. And the same has to happen, by the way, for the older brother. I'm not getting into that part of the story. I love this parable so much as I was just doing this. I, I think I'm going to kind of go deeper into it at a later date, you know. But just so you know, if you're not familiar with the parable, they're celebrating. That's how that ended. And the older brother is still home, and boy, he just, he get mad. And he refuses to go into the celebration, right? So the father, the father goes out to meet him as well doesn't he? And he's trying to explain. I mean, think about this. His father's like, listen, everything I have is yours. Because he already gave a third to the younger son, which means the remaining is all yours, buddy. Right? He gets the rest of the inheritance. So he's saying, my, 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 if you wanted to, he's complaining, you never killed a fatted calf for me. Wah, wah, wah. You know, it's like, well, I don't. But it's yours. You could have done that any time you wanted to have a celebration. But ultimately what he's saying is, is, listen, my welcoming home, my son, 
in no way diminishes my ability to love and care for you. I am no less your father because I am his father as well. And he invites his oldest son to join in in the celebration. Doesn't twist his arm, doesn't guilt him into it, all right? Doesn't manipulate him. He just invites him into the celebration. And you know what? That's where the story ends. Right there. We're left hanging. The oldest son go in? We don't know. You know why? You know why there's no nice, comfortable ending? Because we write the ending. You and I write the ending. Coming home is about a, a heavenly father who loves you so much, he's anxiously waiting for you so he can shower you with forgiveness and completely restore you into his family. And if you're on the other side with the older son, it's up to you to also extend grace, you see. Now maybe, maybe, maybe you're experiencing something like what happened in this parable in your family in your home. And I think the best advice is in this parable. Keep the door open. Keep the door open for forgiveness and redemption and a welcome home. Paul tells us to have the mind of Christ who always welcomes us home. Happy Father's Day. Lord, thank you that you welcome us home always and if we drift we can come back and if we just rebel and 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 lord even squander your grace and, and all of that in our lives but lord if we when in that moment and i do believe lord your holy spirit helps us but in in that moment that we come to ourselves help us to understand you're waiting you're looking you're wanting us to come, and you're ready, Lord, to welcome us with open arms. Thank you, Lord, for doing that for us. Help us, Lord, now, as we try to be more like Jesus, help us extend that, that type of grace around us and in our own homes, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.